Mm. Let's pray. God, we want those those lyrics, those words that we just sang to be our heart's cry, that you'll show us Christ, that we would long to see Jesus in all his glory, in all his fullness, that we would long to have him be our greatest passion and our greatest um, desires, the greatest desires of our hearts. Um, God, we want to recognize you as the one and true and only God and worship you the way you deserve to be worshiped. Um, we lift before you ourselves as we go now into your word that you will speak to us. God, we need your Holy Spirit to do that. We need your spirit to guide us and to direct us. Uh, we need your spirit to open our ears. God, we need your spirit to open our eyes so that we aren't deaf to what you want to teach us, so that we're not blind to the things you need to show us. God, we need your Holy Spirit to do a work in our hearts. I need you to work in my heart so that my heart isn't hard, so that I wouldn't listen or respond or act upon what you teach us through your word. As we think about these things, God, we also pray for our country in this time, this virus, we pray for our president, our vice president, and the staff that they've assembled to lead the country regarding this virus, to right down to our own governor. We pray for President Trump and Vice President uh, Pence, but we also pray for Governor Cuomo. We lift him before you, God, and ask that you'd continue to direct him and his staff of people as they try and uh, Take us through this unprecedented time where there's massive people being uh, sick with this virus and, and thousands upon thousands of people dying, even here in our state. And God, as, as our region uh, contemplates how it's going to open, uh, I think it's former Lieutenant Duffy who's trying to lead this area. And I pray for wisdom for all of them, God, as we open, that we would be able to, um, but that we would do it wisely and that we'd be careful. But God, in the meantime, we want to pray for those who are greatly affected by this. I thank you for those healthcare heroes who have been working um, in the front lines. And for those who, because of this, have also the other side of that coin have been laid off, have not been able to work. And I think about farmers also. And we pray for our farmers, God. We pray that you will provide your grace for them. Thank you for the possibility that they might be able to partner with New York State and, and use the, the surplus milk and, and the funds that would be lost otherwise for that. And we pray that you would expedite that, God, that they would be able to have that as a source of income once again and be able to feed their own families as they work to feed our country. And also, God, we praise you for our mothers. Um, thank you for the blessing of our mothers. Um, and we pray your blessing on them today, that it would be a special day for them, uh, as we are not able to necessarily, whether because of distance or because of the virus, we're not maybe able to gather with our mothers, but if we're able, uh, may it be a great day for blessing on them either way. Um, yeah, God, we praise you and ask for your guidance now as we dive into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. Uh, I just wanted to also say that um, typically now in our church, when we meet on Sunday mornings, we would have an opportunity uh, for an offering. And um, so I just want to use that as an opportunity to remind you that uh, to stay faithful as you possibly can with that. If you're able, um, if you're without work or you're having trouble, um, maybe you could reach out to us and maybe we'd be able to help you. We'd love to be able to do that too. So, uh, but you can use our online opportunity or you can mail it to the church. Um, either way, we'd encourage you to continue to do that. 
I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 7. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go down beneath this computer and plug it in right now. So you're going to have an opportunity now to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 7. I'm going down. There you go. That would have been about 10 minutes in and you'd lost me. Well, maybe that would have been to your advantage. But uh, so, yeah, maybe you saw the announcements. I hope you did. Audrey sends them out every Friday. And in the announcements, we try to put in there the uh, passage of scripture we're using for the week and also uh, the title. The title is Power, Glory, and Judgment. And the passage is from chapter 7. Uh, verse 14, where we ended last week, all the way to the end of chapter 10. Uh, are you nuts taking on three chapters? I, this just might prove that I am nuts. We'll see. But maybe this will increase your prayer life. All right. So I just noticed, though, that after spending quite a bit of time really uh, studying this passage, I kind of discovered that there is such a fascination with the individual plagues and the possible meanings of each that that, that God's purpose behind them kind of gets lost as people try to in, uh, dig into what the meaning of every little thing is and, you know, what does this gnat mean? What are the flies? And what is God doing here? And we get sidetracked a lot. So we're going to take a slightly different approach this morning with these plagues. Instead of taking each individual plague and picking it apart to see what facts and, and tidbits we could uncover and then really kind of like, congratulate ourselves with the, the knowledge that we've gained. Instead, we're going to go through the first nine of the plagues this morning. We're going to save the tenth one for next week. It's the final one. It's the biggest one. It's the, 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 the plague of death on the firstborn. But we're going to list the plagues and all of their, really their impact, relatively quickly. We're going to work through it pretty quickly. But then when we, what we want to do is we're going to go, after we've listed them, we're going to go back and expose what they are intended to expose. See, the plagues are really purposed by God as displays of his power and his sovereignty over any false god. Uh, they're brought about by God upon the, the hard-hearted Pharaoh for his refusal to let God's people go. And so it kind of plays out like a showdown, in a sense, uh, between God and Pharaoh. And Pharaoh and God are going to go toe-to-toe, and Pharaoh, he thinks he's up to the challenge, but he's not. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce, who wrote uh, excellent commentaries, uh, he wrote a commentary on Exodus, and he says, in order to understand these plagues, we need to understand what they're directed against, that they're directed against the gods and goddesses of Egypt and were intended to show the superiority of God, the God of Israel, over the Egyptian gods. There were about 80 major deities in Egypt. That doesn't include all of the minor deities. Some, su some suggest that there could have been up to over 2,000 gods in Egypt. All clustered around, though, three great natural forces of Egyptian life. Water, land, and sky. So it doesn't surprise us, therefore, that the plagues God sends against Egypt in this historic battle follow that three-force pattern, Boyce says. The first two plagues were against the gods of the Nile. The next four are against the land gods, and the next three after that are against the gods of the sky, culminating in the last one, the death of the firstborn. So let's jump in and see in Exodus chapter 7, we're, we're going to start with verse 19. And it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, over their canals, over their ponds, over their pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there were, shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in the, in the vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. 
Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. He lifted up the staff and he struck the water of the Nile. And all the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the fish in the Nile died. And the Nile stank. So that the Egyptians couldn't drink the water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Pharaoh's magicians of Egypt did the same when he called them in and they did the same by their secret arts so Pharaoh's heart remained hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So the first stop in our train ride through the plague stops at the Nile River where God commands Moses and Aaron to meet Pharaoh. It says as he's going down to the water. They were there to be there in the morning. Uh, Pharaoh could have been going there maybe to clean up. Remember uh, Mo when Moses was born, Pharaoh's daughter had gone down to the river to bathe. So it's possible that that is what he was doing. Uh, he could have been going down there to bathe, but it's also possible that he could have been going down there to start to have his quiet time, his devotion to, to pray and to worship his gods, uh, mainly because there were a few gods associated with the Nile. Happy, H-A-P-I, uh, I know it's happy, the happy God, right? Well, happy was the, the major deity of the Nile River. Not the only one, but the main one. He was kind of like the, the in charge deity over the other deities, the other gods and goddesses of the Nile River. So it's likely that, that Pharaoh could have been actually going down there to pay homage to him. And so, because the Nile for Egypt is its source of life and sustenance. There, if there's no Nile River, there would be no Egypt. It would just be nothing but desert wasteland. So happy that God was supposed to be the life-giving God of the Nile. And, and he was viewed as, as their provider. Uh, we look at God, our God, and say he is, he is our, our provider, our, our sustainer, our life-giver. They said that about happy, the God of the Nile. So he's their provider. So Aaron stretches out the staff in his hand, and, and instantly it says all the water in the land is contaminated. The text reads this way, that it's, that it's every source of water, right? All throughout the entire land of Egypt. Because Egypt was mostly desert, they developed this system for moving water from the rivers. They would have built, built canals like we did in the United States, you know, the Erie Canal. And they would have done the same thing to move that water throughout the land to give fertile uh, possibilities for their so their pools of water even the containers that held the water in their houses it says you see it was so bad that it says the land the whole land stunk it stunk because of the contaminated water and the smell of the dead fish that happened as a result of this this dead rotting fish smell think about the smell of roadkill on a hot summer day and you haven't even come close. One of the one of the houses that we lived in when I was in middle school uh, was on a well. A um, number of the houses that we lived in were on wells. That wasn't an uncommon thing. It's not uncommon at all today. Uh, but the thing about this house was the well was sulfur water, and it stunk like rotten eggs. And that's not an exaggeration. You'd turn the faucet on, and it would turn your stomach to turn the faucet on. And Because what came out of there was not only that foul, sulfuric, rotting egg smell, but there was the water itself was kind of blackish. It was disgusting. You couldn't drink it uh, unless you boiled it. But even then, it was hard to get, you know, if it doesn't pass the eye test, it usually doesn't go in the mouth for me. And so I have this aversion, honestly. I do. I'm a water snob today. I don't do what I mean ask my in-laws when we go down to Florida I'm pretty leery about the water that I drink and I think it's because I'm suffering PTSD for in a sense from that sis that so we had to take our clothes to the laundromat it was just bad see the Nile River uh, was was the basis of the entire economy for Egypt and so their entire economy is in jeopardy does that sound familiar? I mean, look at our economy today. The, the virus 
put puts our whole economy in jeopardy, right? And it's angering a lot of people. But could you imagine for just a moment if the coronavirus actually contaminated our water source, our oceans, lakes, rivers, ponds, wells, right down to the bottled water on the shelf at Wegmans, even the bottled water in, in your refrigerator automatically instantly was contaminated, what would we do? So Pharaoh, after Moses and Aaron do this thing, he summons his magicians and, and it says they did the same by their secret arts. That struck me as a little bit odd. Um, whatever it is that they did, uh, by whatever power they used, we're not told, that could have been trickery. They were called magicians, magicians and sorcerers, but it could have been demonic power. Uh, they, they worshiped false gods. And when you worship a, a false god, you open yourself up to demonic influence. And so it's possible that that's what they were doing. We're not told for sure, but what we are told is that they only added to the problem. They made it worse. Now, thanks a lot, right? Uh, they had no power to make it go away. They only added to the problem. So, so their God, happy, their provider, all of a sudden couldn't provide. That's round one. So put a check mark in God's box if you're keeping score. Let's go to Exodus 8, the second plague. Then the Lord, verse 1, said to Moses, go in and to Pharaoh and say to him, now this time they're not going down to the river, they don't think, at least it looks like they're going actually to his house, which is important. And he says, the Lord says, let my people go, that they may serve me, a common refrain. Uh, but if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs and it shall come into your house, into your bedroom and on your bed and in your houses the houses of your servants and your people, and into your ovens and into your kneading bowls. This, all right, you know, you're getting the picture just like the everything in the land was contaminated with the water. Everything is going to be overrun with frogs. Right into the bowls in your cupboards. The frogs, it says in verse 4, shall come up on you and say, and, and on your people. So they're not just coming into the house, they're coming on the people and the servants. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your hand and the staff over the river and the canals and all the pools and make the frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron, boom, stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and up come frogs, uh, covering the land of Egypt, it says. But the magicians, verse 7, did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So one of the things I hope you're, you're catching here just really quickly on the onset is that in each of the plagues, there is an offer of grace given, right? We saw that at the beginning of the first one. Uh, Moses and Aaron said, God says, let my people go. He refuses. He hardens his heart. It comes the second plague. Moses and Aaron say, the Lord says, let my people go. He, they're giving him an option each time. So God is consistently expressing grace to hard-hearted Pharaoh. And I think that's one of the things that gets missed when we just zoom through or uh, when we dig in so deeply trying to figure out what each of the plagues says, we forget that. And so Pharaoh here once again rejects God's offer of grace and it says as a result of that, his heart is even harder yet. It's like there's another coat of shellac being put on the surface so that it's harder to penetrate. And that's what happens when we reject God, when we reject the hearing his word, when we reject um, <clears throat> the grace that he gives us. It's like putting another layer of shellac over our heart, which makes it harder and harder for it to penetrate. So round two, frogs. There is a single tiny little tree frog, uh, not much bigger than a quarter during the summertime that was right outside our, our Karen and my's window every night. We couldn't open our windows at bedtime. This thing w w was just chirped so stinking loud. It's like, how can such a tiny little frog make such a big noise? It would have been like finding a needle in a haystack, but boy, I wish I could have got my hands on that frog. There were times, no joke, I actually went outside and I, threw stuff into the trees. I was so sick and tired of that little frog. Now, imagine 
having the frogs jump all over us while we're actually in bed. Not just little frogs, but big frogs. And you're sleeping there and the things are jumping across and they're jumping across here. It sort of says they were in their beds. The place was swarmed with them. And there's a point to this, right? They came into their houses, into their bedrooms, into their bed, and into the house of the servants, and into the kneading bowls. I mean, just think about this. They were everywhere. You would have stepped on them trying to get into your house, squishing frogs. Now, frogs weren't just some random pick. Or, or some actual commentators actually suggested it was just a natural consequence of the waters overflowing. It probably happened all the time. No, it did not like this. Um, Hecate, H-E-K-A-T, was the god, one of the gods of the Niles. And, and it was the god of fertility, which is just kind of comical to see how God is doing this. But Hecate... The goddess or god of fertility had a frog head. And so when Egyptians worshipped the god of fertility, they were worshipping the frog. So the, to the Egyptians, frogs were sacred. Well, I wonder how they felt about them now. It's like, hey, if it's fertility you want, it's fertility you'll get. Hecate, that frog god, was the one who they believed breathed life into humans. So God fills the land. He breathes life into the land, fills it with frogs to the point where it stinks again so bad that they can't breathe themselves. Once again, the magicians come in. And all they can do is, again, add to the problem. Don't you think you'd stop calling them? It's not like they're helping the situation here at all. There's a little bit of humor in this. I think God is actually having a little bit of fun in the midst of <laughs> this. So Exodus 8 says that Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron. And he said, plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me because the magicians couldn't. He was their source of uh, power and different things, but they had no power over what God was doing. And he says, if you let him go, I'll let, I'll, I'll let the people go. That's how bad it was. So Moses asked, when would you like them to be gone? To show that, that God is sovereign over their coming and their going. He says, Moses says to Pharaoh, pick a day and time. And, and, and tomorrow, Pharaoh says. And I'm like, tomorrow? Why not now? How about, you know, like right now? Get them out of here now. But no, the frogs go. So the next day the frogs go, but Pharaoh refuses to let the people go. That's the picture here. The frogs are an instrument. They're a tool. And they gathered them together in heaps, it says. And the land once again stank. When Pharaoh uh, saw that there was a respite, though, that's when he hardened his heart again. And he wouldn't listen, and he wouldn't let them go. Round two. Check mark for God. So now we move from water to land as we quickly move through these. Uh, Exodus chapter 8, verse 16, we're going to go to the third plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, that it may become filled with gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff, and he struck the dust of the earth, you know, the sand in the desert, and there were gnats on everything, you know, water, all water contaminated, frogs come in, fill everything, gnats like sand, so, so thick, it's like dust. And all the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of the Egypt. In verse 18, the magicians tried, oh, by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. And when the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is from hand of God. This is the finger of God. But there was another layer of shellac over Pharaoh's heart. And here he adds another one. Yet yeah, his heart was hardened and he wouldn't listen to them as the Lord had said. Now, again, not random. The, the, the set, S-E-T, I know we just, you know, like a set. But there was a, a god in Egypt, Set, who was, it was the name of their god of their desert. 
the god of their sand, the god of their dirt, one of the numerous land gods. The ESV translates this, this tiny bug they're describing into gnat, but those irritating, they're tiny little bugs that, that bite you like behind your ears and under your hairline. But modern research actually expects that it was probably more likely mosquitoes. And I want you to think about that. We get annoyed with the sound of one mosquito buzzing around our ear uh, because when we go to bed, this is the only place they know how to buzz. Am I right? Am I right? Give me an amen. Like when you go to bed and there's a mosquito in the room, the only place it knows where to buzz is around your ear. But one of them drives us nuts. And this was so thick, it was blanketing the land. Um, so Pharaoh, so it might have been mosquitoes. And it's like, with all the water around, you wouldn't be surprised. Um, I remember more than once while riding a bike. Uh, I love to ride bike and I go for long bike rides. And every once in a while as you're riding, <clears throat> I know you different guys out there who are bike riders and ladies who are bike riders, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You come upon, all of a sudden there's a swarm of these flying little flitty things and they're like gnats. And, and you, have, you have no choice but to ride through them and they get in your mouth. They go up your nose. If you don't have glasses on, they go in your eyes, they go in your ears. And typically when I ride through there, I am uh, totally saturated in sweat. So it looks like when I get through the other side that I've been tarred and bugged, not tarred and feathered, but tarred and they're just covering me. And so just imagine that situation, that's the picture. So he once again calls us magicians, right? Seriously, let's get more mosquitoes. That's a great idea, but they couldn't. <clears throat> and then and instead, actually, they, they make really what is to become the first uh, in, in a, almost a baby sense confession about God here, right? They say that this is actually that the Hebrew God is greater than our gods. Round three, check mark, God. And you're starting to get the picture. It's 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 going to be God is pitching a shutout here, but but Pharaoh is undaunted, and the land is overrun with mosquitoes. And then comes the flies as we move into Exodus eight verse twenty. It says the Lord said to Moses, "Rise up early in the morning, go present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water again, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me.' Look at the picture of grace once again. God presents that, or else. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I'll send a swarm of flies. Now, the gnats supposedly are still there, right? So they're still combating the gnats. And God says, I'm going to send flies on you. And that's a generic term. There's probably all kinds of flies. And your servants and your people and your houses and the houses of Egyptians. And then verse 22, but on that day, I'm going to set apart the land of Goshen. That's where the Israelites live, where my people dwell, so that no swarm of flies shall be there. So this time, uh, the Lord says it's going to be a little bit different. I'll put a hedge of protection around Israel, my people. And it's going to be like there's an invisible screen that the flies can't penetrate. So if you were outside watching and you can't see the, the invisible border between Egypt and Goshen, that city from one city to the next, but you'd be like you'd be seeing flies and they would be bouncing off. And maybe they're, I don't know what it would look like, but they wouldn't be able to go in there. And if you're watching that, you've got to look at that with amazement. There came such great swarms of flies, says verse 24, that in the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses throughout all the land, that the land was ruined. All right, so remember, He's exposing God by his grace is giving Pharaoh an opportunity to turn to him. But he's also at the same time simultaneously exposing the ineptness, the, uh, the insuperiority of their gods. God is doing multiple things here. We're going to find out the third and greatest thing he's doing in a minute. But for sure he's doing these two things. Simultaneously he is offering grace to Pharaoh while exposing those false props that he has built his identity on. And friends, that is a grace from God whenever he does that. And if that's something that happens to us throughout this process of this virus that God would expose, some of the 
the, uh, the false pursuits or identities or props that we're building our lives upon, that would be so good and gracious of him. But he's doing that here with them. And so it goes on to the fifth plague, uh, the livestock, they're, they're dead. It says that they bloat and fill the land. And you've, you've done the same thing I have. And you got this mental picture just as I do. You see a dead deer in the middle of the summer after a few days, what happens to it? Yeah, well imagine the whole land filled with those. And then the sixth plague, the plague of boils, and the seventh with the hail, and with the eighth, the plague of locusts, until we get to the ninth plague of darkness. The Lord has exposed their, their false gods of water. He's exposed their false land gods uh, to be nothing, and now the Lord is exposing their sky gods to be nothing. Let, let's look at Exodus chapter 10. So jump forward with me. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness in the land of Egypt for three days. They didn't even see one another nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the people of Israel had light where they lived. So imagine that picture, right? But in chapter 10, verse 21, what we're looking at here, again, is not some random thing. It's though God's sitting up there thinking, oh, this one will get him. I know what I'll do. I'll turn the lights off. No, it's he's exposing something in them. By his grace, he's exposing another falseness. Aman Ra. Amon Ra was their sun god. Uh, he was probably their, uh, believed to be their chief deity. He was the god above all of the other gods. So, you know, they had a hierarchy, and at the top of their hierarchy was probably this Raman or Amon Ra, the sun guy. He was their, he was their creator god. And, and, and here, the creator, the Lord, takes their creator, god of light, and locks him in darkness for three days. Think about it. He imprisons their God in the land of the dead. Their creator, life-giving God, he imprisons him in the land of death. All the while, while the people of God are dwelling in the land of the light of the Lord by his goodness and grace. So we said at the beginning that one of the purposes behind God's actions is to expose the false gods of Egypt to be nothing. I think he's accomplished his task. I think you see at the end of the day, God pitched a shutout. It was God nine, Pharaoh zero. It's important to see the grace of God in the midst of this though, isn't it? In exposing the false gods. At one point as I was preparing for this, I wondered, I really did, I wondered if God were to strike, say America, what false gods? would he expose? What, what false god would, would, he, would he expose if he were to strike maybe the church of America? Uh, or I even dare ask, what would he expose in me? Um, America's fascination with, with entertainment, be it the media or sports, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and it only proves that it's something that we greatly worship. It's been said, if you want to know what people worship, follow the money. Well, there you have a pretty good industry right there. Money itself, right? Money itself is worshiped, isn't it? Think about the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 and you know, our 401ks and all these different things. Um, we worship these, we worship that. Um, we worship our bodies, I think, as Americans. The health and wellness sector is has never been bigger, right? I mean, richer and more in demand than it is right now at every moment. So as Americans, though, probably our biggest god we worship are the gods of control and autonomy. Our individual rights and freedoms come before the good of a community or a country, right? And we think about that. As we consider these, then let's just move on and, and turn our gaze towards the church. Is it any different? 
Um, unfortunately, I think the church a lot of times looks like the church can be guilty of worshiping very similar things. At the, so entertainment, we call it worship sometimes, but we have celebrity worship leaders, right? We have celebrity preachers. Doesn't the modern church goer also really worship autonomy? Um, our commitment level seems only as deep as the individual need being met. Personal preference seems to dictate likes and dislikes and, you know, church shopping. And so that's, that's something that churches too, I think we make idols, uh, small gods out of pet doctrines sometimes, exalting some above the others to the point of, of it kind of becomes something that we worship, like we're anti-gay or we're, we're anti-choice or anti-democrat. Uh, when our, our political affiliation gets so entangled with our faith that you can't tell one apart from the other. Or, or maybe on the other side of the spectrum, we have the Reformed Church. You know, the church that believes in Calvinism. Uh, standing against Calvinism may be another church's identity. All these identity markers that we can be in danger of, of actually making idols out of Honestly, the only reason I spend so much time thinking about what would God strike in America and what would God strike in the church, because it's honestly too hard of a question, and I don't want God to expose what he would, might expose in my own heart. Um, when I'm pursuing with greater passion and affections than I am Christ and his gospel, this is, after all, the, the very definition of an idol, the pursuit of anything or, or with greater passion and affections than I would Christ. And, and that's painful for me to think through. Israel wasn't made to serve Pharaoh any more than we've been rescued to serve our own idols or even our own autonomy. We've been rescued to be worshipers, um, serving the Lord. And serving our idols or ourselves is to rob God of the worship that only he is due. That's one of the greatest purposes, I think, of these plagues. It exposes, really, in a sense, that we were created to know and worship the Lord. That our hearts will never be at rest until they find their rest in Jesus. Repeatedly, at the beginning of almost every plague, Moses is commanded to tell Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. The word serve is actually the exact same word as worship. The creator of our soul has created us in such a way that there will be no greater satisfaction in in all of life, than the satisfaction found in worshiping him. All other passions, all other pursuits are only going to leave us wanting in the end. Uh, wasn't this Solomon's conclusion? You know, when he was, he pursued everything under the sun, Ecclesiastes. And at the end of each pursuit, he was still empty until he pursued God for the purpose of finding rest and satisfaction and identity in him. So far, though, God has accomplished half his intended goal in exposing that all other gods are powerless, they're just pretenders. The other half of his purpose is quite simple. It's to display his power and his glory and his superiority so that people would know him, to display his glory so that Egypt and Pharaoh and Moses, along with all Israel and future generations, it says, would know and acknowledge him as the one true God. That's what these plagues are actually about. Fewer episodes in all the scriptures depict with such clarity the power of God, the, the sovereignty of God, or the, the jealousy of God for the glory of his name and renown, the, the judgment of God over all creation, Fewer scriptures expose the superiority of God over all false gods or passions or props or pursuits. Fewer passages expose the, 
the complete dependability of God or the, the perfect, the power to preserve the lives of those who are his. And this is the precisely the main point of these plagues. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly get you, get you to get a pencil up. As so we're going to go back, we're just going to highlight five quick verses. First one, chapter 7, verse 16. So we're going to go back. We're going to see chapter 7, verse 16. And you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you. So Moses says, God has sent me to you, Pharaoh, to tell you to let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. But this you shall know that I am the Lord. God wants Pharaoh to know this. God is revealing to Pharaoh that he is alone, the true God. Or chapter 8, verse 10. He says, Moses says to Pharaoh, Then you, Pharaoh, will know that there is no one like our God. So not only am I the only God, but there is no other like me. There's no one. The Lord, he is God, he is one. The only God, there is no other. Or verse 22, I hope you're underlining these. But on that day, of chapter 8, that is, chapter 8, verse 22, I'll set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarm of flies shall be there. That, so that, circle that, so that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Look at this growing revelation. I am God, I am the only God, and I am present. I am the true and living God, and I am over my people, but I'm also with my people. John 1, verse 4 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. The glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Basically, he's saying, go ahead, cry out to your frog God. Go ahead, cry out to your Nile God. Try crying out to your checkbook when you're in the midst of a crisis. It's not going to help. Notice when Pharaoh seeks help. He doesn't go to Happy, the god of the Nile. He doesn't go to Heket, the, the frog god, or any of the others. He's proven to be useless for salvation. They can't do anything for him. He calls out to Moses as God's representative to plead with the Lord. One of God's purposes in this plague, in these plagues, is to answer Pharaoh's question when he verbalized that way back in chapter 4, who is the Lord? that I should listen to him. God is answering that question. By grace, he's revealing himself. Look at chapter 9, verse 14. For this time, I'll send all my plagues on you yourself, Pharaoh, and your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For by now... I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name and my glory will be proclaimed in all the earth. I'm over the seas, God says, and everything in them. I'm over the skies and all that is in them. I'm over the land. I'm over you, Pharaoh. Your days are in my hands, and ultimately you serve my purposes on earth. Somehow, in the, in the mysteries of the Lord's power, he is revealed through the hard-hearted, through the rebellious, through the atheist, through the agnostic, in such a way that his name will be proclaimed in all the earth. And the last one that we see is in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 10. Last one we're looking at. And the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may what? That I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your sons and of your grandsons how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done with them so that you, Israel, you, Moses, you, Mike, will know that I am the Lord. So these signs are for the purpose of displaying 
the knowledge of God, the power and glory of God to be known for generations. They, they paint really an indelible picture on the hearts and minds for all the generations. We're still reading it today. That God is the Lord and that he is greater than all gods and, and is the merciful, gracious Savior. They're signs in that sense. They are markers. God has given us another sign by which every generation will look that reveals that he alone is God. The merciful, gracious Savior. He's given us Jesus, uh, God's Son, and his sign is the cross. Chapter 1 of Hebrews says, Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. The Son is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And then verse 3 of chapter 2 says, How could we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The plagues are a judgment, really, against plurality uh, and against autonomy, that I have the right to live as I want. Uh, the warning of Hebrews is to not continue in any hard-heartedness in refusing to acknowledge Jesus as Savior by continuing to rely on false gods. And Pharaoh's refusing to acknowledge God as Lord, he's actually setting himself up as God. Like us, I think the Israelites didn't just need deliverance from slavery to Pharaoh. They actually needed to be enlisted into willing heart, deep heart service to the Lord. And that's why these are stretched out over time. They needed to discover that true freedom isn't found in just getting out of Egypt, but it comes, true freedom comes in being wholeheartedly submitted to the Lord God. And this can only happen as we come to know God, as he reveals himself to us through Jesus Christ. So uh, I think the, 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 the evidence of the purposes of the plague is clear, that God would be known and remembered and receive glory and worship that only he is due because he is above all gods. He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. He alone rules in supremacy and majesty. The plagues paint for Pharaoh, for Moses, for, for Israel, for us, a portrait of the severe mercy and saving grace of the Lord God. The knowledge of God through Christ is our only hope to freedom from the lies and lures of idols. The knowledge of God through Christ is our only hope that frees us from the lies of self-reliance. The knowledge of God through Jesus Christ is what frees us from slavery of self-worship. And we praise God for that. We praise God that he sent his son, that we might know him. And so I just want to ask you to bow with me and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessing us through revealing yourself to us through Jesus. And that you reveal also those other things that we have built our lives upon that are not solid rock, but they are the shifting sand. That you revealed yourself to us through Christ and then you you gave us a sign of your amazing grace and mercy to us, and it's the sign of the cross. We know you love us because you have revealed yourself to us and you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. And so we praise you for that, God. And we bow and lift our voice in praise. In Jesus' name, amen.